Hey everyone, it's Dr. Jamil. I hope you're all doing well. Before we dive into today's episode, I wanna give you a quick background of who today's guest is. Jeffrey Holst is a recovering attorney who hasn't had a bad day in more than a quarter of a century. Jeff, who's originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan, pays for his love of adventure and travel through real estate investing. He has climbed to the highest point in Africa, swam with dolphins in the Red Sea, dodged sharks while diving at night in Australia, and hiked among seals and penguins in Antarctica. Jeff has been featured on hundreds of podcasts and radio shows where he has shared his inspiring story of staying positive and overcoming adversity and achieving success despite multiple life-threatening illnesses and financial ruin. Jeff graduated early with honors from Michigan State College of Law. He also holds an MBA. When they're not exploring the world, Jeff, his wife, Becky, and their chihuahua, Trixie, split time between their homes in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and San Juan, Puerto Rico. Jeff is often referred to as the most interesting man in the world. Let's dive in. Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're gonna talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their stories, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today, I have the honor and the privilege of interviewing a truly amazing soul, a friend of mine, a brother, a client, the most interesting man in the world. I want to introduce Jeff Holst to you. Jeff, thank you so much for being with us today. No, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely, man. How are you doing? Oh, well, no bad days. I never have bad days. So, <laughs> so uh, it turns out pretty good. Awesome, man. And we'll definitely be diving into that because I think that'll help a lot of people. And so we'd love to just dive right in and ask you, you know, I have found that successful people, they often have a hero story. You know, it's challenges, adversities they've overcome to get to where they are now. And if you'd please share with us, what's your hero story? Mm, that's that's uh, the first time anyone's ever asked it that way, but I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, so, you know, I like I grew up in a, you know, suburban middle class family. So everything was relatively, uh, you know, normal, you know, middle class American upbringing. Right. So so I don't I don't want to like under you know, I don't want to like, you know, minimize that. Like I've had a lot of advantages in my life, but. Um, I wasn't like most uh, teenagers, not exactly sure what I wanted to do with my life. So I went ahead and, uh, um, and became a lawyer because that seemed like the easiest way to make money. And I just thought, yeah, if I go do this, I can go make some money. I can travel. I can you know explore the world, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, that plan may or may not have worked out. But, but what I didn't do is pick something that I really, truly loved. And, uh, and, and I think that was a mistake in retrospect. But uh, that being said, I, I did pretty well as an attorney. I uh, had a television commercial. Uh, I built a little law firm where I had multiple attorneys working for me. Um, and uh, everything was going pretty well, just a few years out of law school. Uh, and I went down to uh, Machu Picchu in Peru, um, which is a, it's an Incan, for people who don't know, it's an ancient Incan city on top of the mountains. It's like, uh, it's in what they call the cloud force. It's, it's an amazing experience. And I highly recommend people check it out. And I literally sat there, um, you know, at the top of Machu Picchu, looking down at the world and thinking, man, my life is pretty good. And things are going really, really well. And um, two weeks later, it wasn't the same at all. I actually came off the mountain and checked my voicemail. And the one attorney that was working for me at the time and put in a two week notice while I was climbing the mountain. Um, And uh, then uh, when I got back from Peru a week later, he had less than a week left in his uh, time with me. Uh, And I was sick 
And I went to the ER and found out that I had leukemia uh, and it, it pushed me uh, from essentially the top of the world to the bottom of the world at, all at once. I went from a successful law firm to one that was losing $6,000 a week uh, and uh, I wasn't able to work. I spent time in the hospital. I thought I was going to die. In fact, um, when I was first diagnosed, I believed I had weeks to live, not, not months. Right. I mean, maybe if I was lucky, it was in September. And my, my goal then was to live until Christmas. So, you know, two or three months. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, that, that, that was the bottom. Um, it drove me into a personal bankruptcy spiral. I was a bankruptcy attorney. I ended up bankrupt. So that was a little ironic. Um, but that's what I had to overcome to get to where I am now. So, you know, when we're talking about the long arc of a hero story, and I think everyone has a hero story, it's how you define yourself that matters and that stuff. Um, for me, um, I just try to stay positive and optimistic and it turned out I didn't die. And then I was able to rebuild my life in a much more thoughtful manner. Um, and so in retrospect, going through that, that darkness was uh, probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me, because if it hadn't been for that, I might still be a successful, but not entirely satisfied bankruptcy attorney. And I would have seen the world and done a lot of really cool things. I know that because I was already doing those things. But um, the li life that I live now is a million times more rewarding than the one I would have if I was a bankruptcy attorney right now. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. In the those darker times, the challenging moments, the moments maybe where there was some doubt, you know, is this really going to work? Like anything like that. What did you do? What did you tell yourself? What helped you through those kind of moments? Yeah, so I've had this, I mean, I alluded to it at the beginning when you asked how I was doing today, but I've had this mantra uh, since before I even knew what mantras were, which is I never have bad days. Um, it started when I was 17. Uh, I basically uh, was having a bad day, I guess. It's hard for me to even imagine that as a possibility now, but then uh, I was having normal teenage angst type stuff. You know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't terribly happy. I'd broken up with my girlfriend and my parents were going through a divorce and, and uh, I just, I just was uh, unhappy. And I remember looking in the mirror and thinking to myself, this is dumb. I'm young and healthy. Like I should be able to have a good day today. And so I'm going to just declare it a good day. So I said, today's a good day. And I walked outside um, and went through my day and it didn't really change anything. You know, it's not a magic trick. You can't just declare it. Right. <laughs> but I put in the work without even realizing that that's what I was doing. I, I'm just got stubborn about it and said, today's a good day over and over and over and over and over and over again, hundreds of times a day out loud when I was alone and in my head when I wasn't alone. And when bad things would happen, I would try to focus on positive things uh, that happened because, you know, that's the other secret to this strategy is that uh, good and bad stuff happens to everyone every day. Yeah. And for me, I think if you just spend the time, you know, dwelling and focusing on the positive stuff that happens and, and just dealing with the, the, the rest of the garbage, because you can't ignore it, that doesn't solve it either. But um, if you, if you can't control it, and there's something you can do about it, it doesn't do you any good to spend time thinking on it. And this is something I learned from you, actually, when we were talking, you know, um, I think you were talking in context of worry, you know, and, and a quote from Buddha that was, if it, there's no reason to ever worry because you can either do something about it, in which case you ought to just go do something about it, or you can't. And the worrying doesn't help at all. Right. That's a paraphrase, but, but I was doing that exact same strategy when I was 17, I was, if something bad happened, I couldn't do anything about it. I just tried not to think about it. If, uh, if something bad happened and I could do something about it, I went and fixed whatever it was that I needed to do. And by doing that, I, uh, I slowly crafted a lifestyle of, you know, never having bad days. And I remember distinctly when I realized I didn't have bad days, I went into a 7-Eleven and the guy behind the counter said to me, you know, how, how are you doing today? And I said, I never have bad days. And I went, holy bleep, I, I never have bad days. Like I was <laughs> like, I, I literally like didn't realize it. I, I just started thinking about, I had been saying today's a good day over and over again. And, you know, I trained my subconscious to look for positive things. Um, you know, this is, this is stuff that people hear about all the time now, but this is the early nineties and we didn't have YouTube and, and all that kind of stuff to like hear this stuff. So unless you were really focused in on it, you, you weren't being taught it in any, in any fashion. And, and, and I just suddenly went, 
wow, this is amazing. This works for me. And so I started paying attention and realized I hadn't had a bad day in a long time. At that point, a couple of months. Um, now, 26 years later, I still haven't had any bad days. Even my darkest days, like when I got sick, I remember people coming into the hospital and saying to me, I bet today's a bad day, almost like they wanted to prove that it was impossible. And I was like, well, I was diagnosed at 10 o'clock at night. Most of the day was actually pretty good. I didn't even know. I just thought I had a cold or something. You know, I was trying to recover from pneumonia, I had pneumonia. And that's actually why they ended up doing the blood work that discovered the leukemia I had. Um, but uh uh, but yeah, so I mean, when I was diagnosed, I, I thought, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. And then the next day was a little bit harder because I knew I was sick the whole time. But uh, about two in the afternoon, um, there was a shift change at the hospital and I'd sent my wife home. She had been in the hospital for 36 hours without sleeping. I sent her home. I said, you need to get some rest. And this nurse walked in and she looked at me and she said, oh, my God, Jeff, I'm so sorry to see you here. And I recognized her and said, oh, my God, Shelly, I'm so happy to see you. I'm so happy I'm here. And I meant it. Right. I was like, this is a babysitter of mine from when I was like, you know, seven or eight years old that I hadn't seen in a decade or more. And I was just really excited to see her. And that was the thing that my subconscious that had spent 13 years training itself to look for positive and everything went, if you didn't get sick right now, you wouldn't be seeing Shelly. Like, you know, and that was enough to make that day feel good to me. And, you know, I think Shelly thought I was insane. And for sure, when I tried to explain to my wife that I was super happy that I saw Shelly, she was kind of like, yeah, but you're still dying. Right? <laughs> you know? And I was like, yeah, but maybe not. Like, like if today's good, then maybe tomorrow will be good too. And, and I just kept doing that. And, you know, and I found something to be positive about every day. And pretty soon, you know, I, because again, taking responsibility for the bad stuff that you can do something about, I looked at my life and said, okay, I need to get really good treatment. Uh, it's not my fault that I have leukemia, but uh, it is my responsibility to figure out who, the, who are the best doctors, what are the best courses of action. And uh, I did that and, and you know, I was fortunate and didn't die and I'm still still here. So that's uh, that's kind of the, the thing for me. Thankfully for all of us, you know, you're still here. And yeah, well, I appreciate being here, obviously. Um, but but I will say this, if I had died, it would have been okay with me. Like, I know that sounds weird. I didn't want to die. I learned very quickly yeah. that I preferred being alive. Um, and I often tell people I want to live till the energy death of the universe. So if I can figure out a way to <laughs> defeat old age, I'll just stick around as long as I can, because I love life. And I love it even more once I realize that I could die. Yes. Something that a uh, few things that you just talked about, I wanted to you know, tag on to. First, I want to acknowledge you that you embody the energy and the being of being a creator. And this is something for everyone who's listening. I want you to notice what Jeff did. Jeff made a decision. I don't have bad days. That isn't something that, oh, he's just so blessed that he doesn't have bad days, but you do. One thing I told Jeff when we first met, People have days. They determine if they're good or bad. You might say, oh, today was a really bad day. But for somebody else, today is the best day of their life. So how's that happening? Because it's not the day. It's you and how you relate to it. So when Jeff made that decision, I want you to notice that it's not a matter of fake it till you make it. I'm not a fan of that phrasing. But for me, it's all about be it until you see it. Jeff made that decision and he started living his life from that place. And when did he do it? He did it right now because notice that the past and the future aren't real. The past is only real in your memory and the future is only real in your imagination. So you really only have this moment. So when is the future created in the present? So when can you, what is that uh, source of power, the seat of change where you can transform your life right now? And that's the only place it ever exists. And so Jeff made that decision and you can too. I saw yeah. that's something I want well, to bring up. And, and you know, I, I have like when I tell people that I never have bad days, and, and I've told, you know, literally thousands of people in person over the last quarter century or so. Um, you know, but also, you know, I've been on lots of podcasts talking about it as well. But I get one of two or three reactions to it, right? One is, oh, that must be nice. Like, I wish that would happen to me, but 
you know, that's something that, you know, you're lucky you get that. And, and for the reasons you said, that's, that's not true. It's a choice. Like, I mean, I made this choice and there's no reason that other people can't do it. The other response that I often get is they just don't believe me. Um, I don't know how to combat that one. Right. It was like, I can explain to someone that you can make a choice and they can look at me and say, yeah, that's, that's true. But, but if they don't believe me and I think I'm lying, um, then my answer to them is, you know, just spend some time with me. Cause if you see me enough, you'll see that this is exactly who I am. And this is something that I've been spending the last few years working with you and working on myself is, is just being fully authentic all the time, right? Um, and just like that way um, with the no bad days thing, it's super easy for me because it's really who I am. But um, it turns out that that's how it should be about everything in your life, right? If you really lean into who you are and you choose, like you said, you create who you want to be um, and you speak that into existence, then it, it becomes so much easier to live your life. Um, and then all this stuff becomes easier. And, and I'll tell you, it, it's a lot easier to have good days than bad days. Mm. So if you got to pick one, <laughs> you might as well pick that. Right. And, and the thing is, like you said, I think, um, you know, you don't like fake it till you make it. And then you had it's like, um, see it um, you see it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's good. But the way I, what, the way I look at it with, with no bad days is um, how you perceive the day is how you receive the day. Yes. That's that's my my little um, rhyming thing that I think of. It's like, however you perceive it, that's how you're going to receive it. Yeah. And one thing I want to bring up for anyone listening, because I know that what Jeff and I are saying is not trying to belittle any challenge, any hardship, any pain that you may be experiencing right now or that you have experienced in your life. You know, Jeff has gone through a lot. I've gone through a lot. I know you've gone through a lot. Whoever's listening. And at the same time, recognizing that even in our darkest moments, like Jeff said, how you choose to receive the day or perceive it rather, what you look around, you know, anyone who's listened to episode one of the podcast, I shared, you know, some aspects of my story. And even in the days where, you know, my dad almost died and we were taking care of him and it was really rough. There was a lot of challenge. I still woke up that day like people that I really cared about woke up that day. Some great stuff also happened that day. So notice when we get selective and we just label the day as bad because something really challenging might've happened, but there's a lot of other stuff that happened too. That's really wonderful, but we kind of discount it or we don't pay attention to it in the moment. So whatever you're going through, you know, you have our love, you have our respect, you have our support, reach out, we'll talk. (laughs) And at the same time, you know, life can be, beautiful. It can be a miracle, but I often tell people the miracles are all around you, but you only see them if you're looking for them, you know, you find what you're looking for. And so if you don't see it, it's because you're not looking for it because you're kind of in the story, you're in the muck, the thick of all the hardship, all the challenge. When you focus on what's out of your control, when you focus on all the things that are missing that you don't have, life's going to feel a certain way but there's a lot of things that are in your control and there's a lot of things that you do, um, you do have, right? So it's not a matter of positive, think your way out of it. It's not a matter of like spiritual bypass. It's not a matter of hardship doesn't happen. It's none of that, but you get to determine how you receive it. Like all this stuff happens and you're the meaning generator. What do you make this mean? And that generates your whole experience. Anything you'd like to say to that, Jeff, before Uh, there's so much that I could pull out of what you just said. That's very, (laughs) very accurate. But, but again, the, the real key here is bad stuff will happen to you. It's probably going to happen to you every day. In fact, I I think it will happen to you every day. And for sure, even if it doesn't happen to me or to you, it's happening to somebody. There's always something bad happening. There's always something good happening. Um, And, and, and you're a hundred percent right. It's not about ignoring it and saying that didn't happen. It's about dealing with it in the most efficient way possible. And sometimes the most efficient way to deal with something hard is to just move on and move past it. And and to just recognize that 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 thing happened Mm. and and that's okay because you didn't have any control over it. Yeah, I remember, you know, since I was 15, one of my biggest mentors is Tony Robbins. And when when I was 15, I remember hearing him say, what's wrong is always available but so is what's right. 
right? So if you look for what's wrong, you'll always be able to find it. If you look for what's missing, what's broken, all the reasons why the world sucks, you'll find it. Yeah, I mean, that's like the um, <laughs> classic, like, uh, quote attributed to Henry Ford, right? Like, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. Right. Yeah. Like, and, and I think that there's a lot of wisdom to that. At first, it sounds kind of, you know, flip. It's like, oh, well, you know, because, you know, you, you, it's really easy to go, well, there's some things that are objectively impossible. Right. But, but maybe not. Right. Like people said it was impossible to fly and then people invented airplanes. Right. <laughs> people, you know, and when you really, when you really come down to it, almost everything that we've accomplished as a society in the last 50 years was impossible in the 50 years before that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that, that continues to be true and we have no idea. And I'm not just talking about technology. I'm talking about um, all of it, you know, even, even moral philosophy continues to evolve. The world gets better in my opinion, all the time. There are worse things that happen. Sure. Cause good and bad stuff happens. Right. Yeah. Um, but again, there's just this trajectory of, of positivity that you can tap into and you can live into that existence. Yeah, I often you know, remind people when you're looking at your life and you're looking at the story that you weave, the story that you tell about, this is who I am. This is the way my life is. This is the way the world is. Does that story serve you? And it might. And if it does, awesome. You know, it serves you in the sense that it's moving you in the direction you want to be. You're fulfilled with your life. You're happy. Beautiful. You keep doing it. You're winning. And at the same time, you might recognize, no, you know, my story doesn't serve me, but you might not even call it a story. You might think that's life. You might think this is the way that I am, like you're some concrete static thing. But one thing I, I shared with you and I share with everyone that I work with, you are pure possibility. You are this moment. You are who you decide to be. And the past, which I said earlier, only exists in your memory. The only reason why you keep being who you've been is because you just think that's who I am. But the moment you realize I don't need to keep being that if it doesn't serve me anymore, if it doesn't choose me, or if it doesn't serve me rather, I can go forward and I can, re I can reinvent myself. I can choose anew. So one thing I wanted to ask you, Jeff, for anyone listening who's going through challenge, going through hardship, going through maybe their version of what you experienced, you know, what message do you have for them right now to help them along their journey? Uh, I'm going to steal some. Well, I'm going to borrow something from a friend of mine, Heather Moyes, who's a Olympic um, gold medalist two times over in bobsledding for Canada. Mm. And she wrote this excellent book called Redefining Realistic, right? Mm. And uh, she has this section in the book where she talks about um, a beach ball, right? I don't think I've ever even shared this with you before, Jamil, but like sh when you look at a beach ball, it has like different colors on, on different sides. And if, if you imagine people sitting in a circle around a beach ball, um, you know, this, you can only see a certain number of colors. And like, I might look at it and go, this ball is, you know, red and yellow. And you might sitting across from me go, this is a blue and green ball, right? Because you can only see blue and green and I can only see red and yellow. Um, and, and that doesn't make either of those perspectives wrong. It, it, it's, if you look at that situation, sometimes all you need to do is come at it from a different angle and yeah. you can see this solution to your problem like it's possible that the solution to the problem is written on the blue section and i just can't see the blue section right um and so when you're dealing with something i think sometimes it's useful to step back and try to look at something from a different angle or try to it's like standing in someone else's shoes if i can walk around to the other side of the beach ball and sit where jamil's sitting then i'm going to see it a different way yeah and and I think that that's a really useful thing when you're dealing with stuff to look at it and say, okay, how, how would someone else have tackled this? Because more likely than not, someone has dealt with whatever you're, you're dealing with and has successfully dealt with it. And, and other people have unsuccessfully dealt with it, or they've got the result. It's not even really unsuccessful. You're going to get the results that, that you get from taking the actions that you take in relationship to whatever you're dealing with. And so if you can look at someone else and say, this person say, you know, Jeff overcame leukemia by staying positive. Now it doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to like, cure a fatal disease by being happy. I don't mean that, right? But you can look at how I reacted and you can take the parts of that that worked for me and apply it to your situation and say, yeah, that, that works for me. And, and, and I'm not, I'm picking myself as an example, but, but it doesn't matter who it is. You have to find 
different ways to deal with it. And I think she, Heather calls it um, I, I something, it's some play on coming at something from out of town. It's like sometimes when you deal with someone who grew up in a completely different uh, place than you, they have a different perspective on it, but it's that same concept of applied, right? Like you can go read books about people that have accomplished things or overcome adversity or have dealt with that, or you can go seek a mentor that's been through what you're going through mm-hmm. or has, you know, has just has a different perspective because their unique life experiences are different. This is where coaching is extremely useful. I find it incredibly useful to hear your perspective. You might not know what you're going to say to me that's going to, um, you know, that's going to trigger the correct response for me, but your perspective allows me to look at things from a different angle. Mm. I, thank you for that. And I love the beach ball metaphor. Yeah, I've heard there's a meme I saw probably years ago and it's same idea. It was the number six is on the floor, but it's sideways. And there's one person on one side and one person on the other, and they're both pointing and one of them's going six and the other one's saying nine and they're like yelling at each other. Right. Just the perspective with which they're looking at it. And to Jeff's point, regardless of what you're experiencing in your life right now, I find it to be such a useful initial step. Question your thinking, question the thoughts that you have about whatever you're telling yourself the situation means. What else could it mean? What other perspectives could I take on this? You know, somebody else in the world has solved this, or maybe somebody else in the world even thought this was a good thing. This is an opportunity. This is a challenge to overcome. How could they think that? And just by asking questions like that, it kind of loosens up the grip that you have on the way I'm seeing things is the right way versus the way I'm seeing things is a way. And the moment we realize that, everything opens up for us. Yeah, I mean, and the way I would look at that too is um, it's really useful to think of all of your challenges as challenges and not as bad things, right? Like I say good and bad stuff happens as some stuff, but, but much like days are neither good nor bad, an event is neither good nor bad. It's how you perceive it that matters, right? So I could be like, wow, I got leukemia, that's terrible. Or I can be like, I'm really happy I got leukemia because now I'm having this conversation with Jamil that I would not have had had I not gotten sick when I got sick. Something that you just said that I'd love to bring up that I think could really serve people. And, you know, I, I, I can't say this applies to everybody, but I can say it does apply to, I think, most, if not all the people I've spoken to. If you look back at your life and you pinpoint some of the most challenging times, some of the hardest times that in the moment, it was devastating. In the moment, it's like, how am I going to get through this? But assuming sufficient time, and that's going to be different for everybody, but sufficient time has passed. If there are things in your life now that you really love, that you're really grateful for, that you're really happy about, oftentimes, if you look and you kind of, if you connect the dots going backwards, you would not have or be or experience those people or those things if you hadn't gone through that hardship. And when I look at my own life and I think about some of the moments that I think back to and say, those were the hardest moments of my life, they were so defining and they shifted who I was being so much that it's like a trial by fire. You know, I got forged in the fire. They, they shifted who I was so much that I look back in my life and the greatest things that are in my life now would not be here if I didn't experience that hardship, which now means that, like you said, it was a hardship for sure. But was it a bad thing? And then I look back and I go, well, if that was a bad thing, a lot of really good stuff came out of it. That doesn't mean I wanted the bad thing to happen. But because the thing happened, I went through it the way that I did. The lessons that I learned, who I became along the way. What if we drop the idea that good and bad things happen? What if we come from the space that life happened the way that it did? It is happening the way it's happening now. And you have somewhat of a say in how it's going to continue happening going forward. And you get to control that meaning that will create your life experience. That to me is the most practical, realistic way of looking at your life where it's not just like, like like I said before, it's not just trying to drown it out with positivity. There's challenge, there's hardship. You're going to go through stuff. And who do you become as a result of that? Do you crack under the pressure or does it grow you? Does it make you a stronger, wiser version of you who then can be a light onto other people and help them through their hardships? And, you know, it makes you just a, 
to your to what I referred to you as the most interesting man in the world. You know? <laughs> it, yeah, it gives you that perspective as well. Well, listen, um, well, I appreciate that, of course, that you keep telling people that. And uh, I get a kick out of it because I, I do try to live my life that way. That is a big part of who I am. It's like when I'm making decisions, I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, what's the more interesting result here? You know, like what, what will be what will be the thing that will make the better story? You know, and I told you that the first time that we met and I, I don't know that I've shared it publicly before, but um, one of my life goals. In fact, maybe my primary life goal, if you really distill everything down to one thing is just to be an old guy, um, you know, on a beach bar somewhere and have a young kid come up to me and care about what I have to say. Cause I figure if I've done that, that I've got like, you know, I've gotten old, that's, that's goal one. And I have an interesting story. I'm probably, uh, I probably did it right. So uh, I try to live into that as much as I can. Uh, and that's why I've got to do amazing things in my life, you know, and it's really, it's worked really well for me. And I would encourage people not necessarily to adopt that exact strategy because everyone has their own goals, but to really think about and, and really get clear on where you want to end up. Because if you do that, it's a lot easier to get there. If you don't know where you're going, you're going to get somewhere, but it's not, probably not going to be where you actually want to go. Right. Yeah. Um, and I know that's, you know, a little flip and cliche, but, it, but it's also true. Mm. Um, and in my experience, um, that's worked, you know, it's worked really well. It's, it's, it's created a life that um, I wouldn't trade for any, anyone else's life. I, mm -hmm. I literally can't imagine a life that I would want to live different than the one I'm living right now. Mm. I love that, man. And so what you just said, is such a, it's one of the aspects of why I do what I do. How can I help people go to sleep at night where when their head hits the pillow, if they found out they weren't going to wake up tomorrow, that they could be completely at peace with the life that they lived up until this point. And like you just said, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. Like, this is what I want to do. And we all have, even if, and for some of us, we're in a situation where it might be more challenging to get out of, but we all have that option to step into a richer version of that life that we'd love to live. And so I'd love to ask you, you know, as you know, the foundation of my work is helping people create an extraordinary life without regret. What for you would really be an extraordinary life without regret? What does that mean to you? Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's a great question. And, and again, I think in a way it is what I was just alluding to. Um, I want to continue to live my life in a way that I'm proud of the things that I'm doing. Right. Um, so I have certain beliefs that are important to me. Um, I want to help people um, achieve the best version of their life. That's a really important thing. It's fundamental to, you know, my personal um, life mission to help people live the best version of their life. Um, similar to what you're doing, frankly, you know, and, and I do that in a lot of different ways. But but what it really comes down to is if I'm leaning into being authentic with myself then I'm, I'm living an extraordinary life without regret. And I, I really do know that it's possible to do that because I, I have lived an extraordinary life. I always, um, you know, and I have a forthcoming book and I think you've read this part of it, but, but at the beginning of my book, I explain how I look at extraordinary. Um, I look at extraordinary as really two words, extra and ordinary. And a lot of people, um, first say to me, well, wouldn't that just mean you're a little bit more ordinary if you're extra ordinary? But I look at it more like um, the, the root of extra being like extraterrestrial, like from somewhere else or beyond, right? Because that's really what it is. So I'm always saying if I can live a life that's beyond what ordinary people do, then I'm okay. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. So I try to live um, and make my decisions based on that. And if I can do that, then I'm not going to regret anything that I do because mm -hmm. you're going to regret the things you don't do a lot more than the things that you tried that didn't work out. Mm. What you just said, it, yes, I, I, th I think it was uh, I'm, I'm, uh, Thomas, I forgot who said it, but it's, that, it's the quote, you know, 20 years from now, you're going to regret the things that you didn't do more than things that you did. And it's that idea that there are people listening right now who have something that they would love to do, but they don't do it because they come from the space of fear and they ask the question, what if it doesn't work out? And that question leads them to this kind of analysis paralysis and then they just don't do anything. But I often flip it and I'll just question, what if it works out greater than you can possibly imagine? 
What if you taking this one step is the very thing that God, life, the universe was waiting for you to do to unleash all this abundance into your life? And that's all you had to do was step forward into that fear. What if, you know, I, back when I was younger, I would give these talks on relationships and I would share stories where, you know, I can only speak from the perspective of a guy, but you go and you find someone attractive and you want to ask them out and you're terrified and you, and like deep down, you don't even know why, but it's like, there's that fear of I'm going to die. <laughs> and then you ask them out. And even if they say no, there's this relief of it wasn't that bad. I didn't die. I live to tell the tale. Mm. <laughs> and now, yeah. I have, now I have some courage. Now I can do it again. And so I often tell people as well, courage is not a requirement. It's a result. Courage, confidence, they don't always start in the beginning with you. They might show up in the middle. They might show up after you do the thing. So if you want to do something and there's some fear, that doesn't necessarily mean don't do it. A distinction I share with people is the difference between rational fear and irrational fear. You know, rational fear is like, do I want to jump out of a plane without a parachute? No. Do I want to jump into like a shark tank? No, right? Those are rational because they're survival. I kind of actually do want to <laughs> jump into a shark tank. That sounds fun. Yeah. But, <laughs> we have a different idea of rational, apparently. But the idea of this rational fears keep you alive, but irrational fears prevent you from living. Irrational fears are... I want to go speak to that group of people, but I won't because what if they don't like me? I want to ask that person out who might be the love of my life, but I won't because what if they say no? I want to ask for that promotion because I'm working my butt off and I know I deserve it, but I don't because I want to be a people pleaser. It's like all these kind of ways, we're not always thinking that way, but notice where your fear is irrational versus rational. And if it's irrational and you actually are excited about the result that could happen, my recommendation is dive in because like Jeff said, and whoever said that original quote, <laughs> you're going to you're going to regret the things you didn't do, not the things that you did doing the, the things that you do that don't work out. They lead to some fun stories The yeah. things that you don't do that they, they lead to some regret. Well, so I think it's ironic that you said dive in um, since you said you wouldn't jump into the shark tank. But <laughs> um, but but I mean, again, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to jump into a shark tank that's in a feeding frenzy. But, uh, you know, going snorkeling or scuba diving with sharks is pretty entertaining. So, um, you know, as long as they don't eat me, I'm OK. Right. Like, um, but uh, if you can give me that guarantee before, I'd be OK with it, too. <laughs> well, sometimes, um, you know you might experience some rational and some irrational fear, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you're jumping into a shark tank, that's, um, you know, because you're a scuba diver and you're at an aquarium somewhere and you're cleaning the um, tank and people do it every single week, you, you're going to feel some fear because you're swimming with sharks, literally, yeah. right? But, but also rationally, you have to know that that's a relatively safe thing because mm -hmm. they're well-fed and not hungry and they're used to divers coming in and cleaning their tanks and all yeah. that kind of stuff, yeah. right? So some of it depends a little bit on context, but, but when you think about fear to me, I mean, I like the rational versus irrational thing, but I also like to look at fear as something um, that should motivate you. If you don't experience any fear, then you're not accomplishing anything because every time you do something that's outside of your comfort zone or outside of something that you're doing, like in, in my context, I'm a real estate investor. I could go buy a whole bunch of single family houses and duplexes forever. And I wouldn't feel much fear because I've done that a lot. I know how to do it. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, that, that action. Right. Um, but if I want to start buying, um, bigger deals, or I want to build a, a hotel or something, I'm going to feel some fear. I'm going to wonder if I'm making the right move. Um, and, and that fear is really, really healthy. Um, and if I ran away from that fear, I would never, ever accomplish anything. I wouldn't have bought the first single family house. Right. Mm -hmm. So I never would have gotten comfortable doing that, that action. Awesome. So I think if you're not feeling any fear in your life, then you really have to evaluate, like, why am I not feeling fear? Like, is it because I really have accomplished everything that I ever wanted to accomplish and I have no desire to improve at all? Because if you don't feel any fear in my estimation, you're, you're probably not actually working on yourself at all. Yeah. If there's no fear, you're probably, you're probably playing smaller than you're capable of. Yeah, exactly. Well, one thing I'd love to take a moment to just brag on you a little bit about for everyone listening, there's a reason why I call Jeff the most extraordinary, the most interesting man in the world. First of all, it's because, and when you think about who he is, which many of you, if you don't know him, 
hopefully you'll dive in, you'll look into what he shares later on, you'll reach out and connect with them. Jeff has traveled to all seven continents. He's been around the world. He's just he was just in Puerto Rico and Antarctica. And he's doing all this <laughs> in the same stuff. week, right? In the same week, yeah. Talking yeah. about a temperature change. You know, he he wrote this great book that I read a couple months ago. It's called The Coronavirus Collective. He co-authored it. And just his chapter alone to me made the whole book. I loved your chapter, man. I told you that Thank when you. I read it. I, I think I had tears when I read your chapter. It was so beautiful and well-written, and it shared so much of your story, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and everything was amazing. And just to hear like what you went through along the way, but also being you know, a master in the real estate space, making a new book right now that I have the privilege of getting an early copy and I'm reading it and it's great. And just loving everything that you're about. One thing I wanna give you the opportunity to share is your last life ever philosophy. And mm. I'd love for you to share that with people, what that's all about. Yeah. And I mean, that's sort of the overarching fundamental philosophy of my life, right? So um, it didn't always start that way. It's something that developed over time, you know, from getting sick and stuff. But the idea is, um, you know, recognizing that we really only get one chance to live this life. And it doesn't really matter what you believe, um, whether you believe in reincarnation or you're an atheist and you think that the world ends when you die, any of any of the ranges of beliefs that are between there, what we know for sure is that we only get one chance to live this life, the one that we're living right now. And when that's gone, we cannot change it. Um, this moment that we're living right now won't be the same moment that we're living uh, literally already, right? Like now we're in a different moment again and we can't go back and change what we did and what we said and what we experienced. And, and so the last life ever philosophy is about helping as many people as possible recognize that you do only get this one life and that, that you owe it to yourself, but, but not just to yourself, really to your family, um, your community, and even the world to live the best possible version of your life. Because, um, you're unique and individual and you're the only you that will ever exist. There'll never be another Jamil. There'll never be another Jeff. Like if we don't live the best version of our life, then the opportunity for anybody to ever live that, that life is gone forever. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you believe that you have something valuable to offer, and I know you do, every single person has something valuable to offer to the world. And it might not be that you're going to change the whole world. Not everyone's going to become rich and famous and all this stuff, but, but you're going to change the world of somebody, right? You're going to say something nice to a person working at a gas station, and that might change their entire life. Um, for me, when I walk into a convenience store and someone asks me how I'm doing, and I say, I never have bad days, Many times that doesn't change someone's life, but every once in a while it does. And when it does, it changes their whole world because now they don't have bad days anymore. And, and, and that's the kind of stuff that I feel like you have to lean into. And that's, that's why I say it's the overarching theme of everything I do. So I have a podcast, the last life ever podcast. You've been a guest on it. It's a great show, but even if people never watch our show or listen to our show, it's, it's fine because everything I do leans into that, right? How do I Jeff live the best version of my life that I possibly can? And I do that by sharing my philosophy. That's why I wrote the, you know, my chapter in the coronavirus collective and why we had 30 other authors write chapters in there about um, how they were dealing with the coronavirus and wh what their thoughts were and, and how they were trying to stay positive in spite of all the uncertainty that's in the world right now. Um, but it's also why I'm working on my, my book, which you, you know, which you've been nice enough to read and offer feedback on. So thank you for that. Uh, but it's also why I come on other people's shows, like why, why I say yes, when you call me and say, hey, can I interview you on my show? It's because I want to share with as many people as possible that philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's how I focus my whole life, right? Like, I choose to do um, things that are interesting and be the most interesting man in the world, not because of the fact that I like doing interesting things. I do like doing interesting things, but I do it because I can live a life that provides an example for other people about how they too can live extraordinary lives, or as you say, uh, an extraordinary life without regret. Mm. Love that, man. And uh, to your point, I'd love to just say for anyone listening, if you could really tune into what would the life of my dreams, what would that extraordinary life without regret look like? You, know, you can go as detailed as you want, as broad as you want, either way, but you get some idea 
of what you would like and recognizing that nothing changes if nothing changes, right? Life will stay the same. The future will be like the past if you keep acting the way you've been acting. But the moment you start making new decisions, the input changes, the output changes, it has to. And so the thing that I find fascinating is everyone has the experience at some point in their life of it might have been a couple of days, a couple of weeks, it might have been a whole year, but you were in a massive action kind of phase. You got a lot done in a relatively short period of time. And when you look back, you go, oh, wow, like so much happened. A lot changed. Like, you know, I remember looking back at my just my business over the last three years. And I did this um, in January and I reflected back and it was like it was so beautiful to just go, wow, this happened, this happened, this happened. Now, all those things that happened were preceded by some action that I took. And I look at it and I say, it's only been three years. And yet so much has changed in the last three years in that same way. If you're listening to this, regardless of what your age is right now, you have time. And if you can come from that space of, if I start it right now, if I start it today and every day I took one step, however small in the direction towards my dream, how different could my life look in a month, in six months, in a year, in 10 years? Another quote I remember hearing from Tony Robbins, most people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in a decade. And I love that. It's so true. And it's, it's almost like compounding interest. You know, you make these decisions and they, they stack on top of each other. And eventually it's a completely different life. And some, sometimes people might be listening and saying, all right, but I, I'm afraid. I don't know the whole, what, what it's all going to look like. And it reminds me of the Martin Luther King Jr. quote, you don't have to see the whole staircase just take the first step in faith. Because if you imagine like a, a staircase shrouded in darkness, except for the first one, you take the step. But the moment you take the step, that second step starts to clear away and you can see it, but you couldn't see it from the beginning. And then when you take that one, three shows up. And that's how life is. But if you live your life coming from, I have to have it all figured out. I got to know the end before I even start. You're never going to start. And so just like Jeff decided, I'm not going to have bad days. He didn't say, well, I'm not going to have bad days because I know nothing challenging, nothing challenging is ever going to happen to me. He made the decision first and life approached him from that way of being. And then the result was what it was. Yeah. And I have an analogy that I think is related to this that I, I uh, actually, I wrote into my book. You may have not gone to that section yet because I don't think you're done, but um, the, uh, um, the, like, if you want to like launch a rocket, to the International Space Station, right? It takes a tremendous amount of effort, tons of fuel, like 95, 97% of all the fuel is used up in getting yourself into orbit, right? Mm -hmm. But once you're in orbit, you just need to make like little adjustments to get to the International Space Station. You could literally launch a rocket uh, to orbit and miss the International Space Station by half of the world. And it wouldn't matter because you just got to make little adjustments because you've already taken that massive action and pointed it in the right direction. So that's why I was saying earlier, you, you don't need to know exactly how you're going to get somewhere, but you need to know where you're trying to go, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so if you can pick the, the general direction of where you want to end up, then you can make those little changes, um, you know, as the things reveal themselves, as that next stair comes up, or when you get to the fork in the road and you get to decide, do I want to go right or left or straight um, or up or down, whatever it might be, when you make that decision, you're making it on the information you have at that particular time. And you can constantly be making adjustments and, and clarifying your trajectory until you get to where you want to be. But if you don't know which way you're going, then you're going to make the wrong decision or you're going to end up receding, right? Because that's the other thing. If you try to stand at the base of the stairs in your um, example and you see that first stair and you just stand there, it's not like you just get to wait forever. The, the stair is either going to dissolve over time. The opportunity is not going to exist anymore mm -hmm. or you're going to slowly wither away and die, yep. right? Like at some point that opportunity will not be there anymore. And um this is something I tell people all the time. When I first started investing in real estate was after I got sick. Mm 
I wanted to invest in real estate when I was 18 years old. I read, you know, rich dad, poor dad, and it got me excited about the idea of investing in real estate, but I didn't do it. And I thought when I get out of law school and I start making some more money and I have some cash, then I will invest in real estate. But it really was a a function of me saying someday I will invest in real estate. Um, And the problem with someday is, is it's not on the calendar. Yeah. There's no day. There is no someday, right? There's Tuesday, <laughs> there's Monday, <laughs> but there's no someday, right? Like yeah. you have to do it sometime and that, it, but you can't do it sometime. You have to do it now. Like you yeah. said earlier, right? Like the only time you can do anything is right now. And that's literally the only time. And, and if you just keep waiting for someday, it may never come. And uh, so if there's something you want to do, like you were alluding to, there's a extraordinary result that you want for your life. And you're thinking, oh, well, when I'm older, when I'm younger, when I'm healthier, when I'm whatever, when I'm richer, um, maybe instead of worrying about that, just figure out how you can start making progress towards that thing now. Yeah. And to your point that you just said, you know, a masterful, let's say life is created one day at a time. And yeah. when we recognize that, if, we, if, you're, if you set out to, to experience an extraordinary life, that might feel too big. But it, what if you can just create an extraordinary moment? Right. And I, by the way, I didn't start out with, I never have bad days. Like if yeah. you listen to what I said, I started out by saying, today's a good day over and over again. Yeah. The reason I never have bad days is because I've had a whole bunch of good days in a row. Yeah. Right. Like, and, and it wasn't, and you know what, I could have a bad day tomorrow if I decide to stop and allow that to come into my life. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I could choose to stop having good days, just like I chose to have good days. Um, I won't do that. I refuse to do it. It's not, it's, it's, it's a core part of my belief, right? Like people call me the no bad days guy, right? Like I have coffee mugs. I wish I had one in front of me right now that say no bad days on it. Right. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but the point is like, it's one day at a time. There's a lot of wisdom to that. Um, you know, the book that I have coming out, I told you, is it's going to be called No Bad Days, How to Make Every Day Great. But if I ever write a sequel, I really think it will be um, something along the lines of, you know, a whole bunch of good days in a row or like, <laughs> oh, or today's a good day or one good day at a time. Probably one good day at a time is probably what I would go yeah. with, because that's the thing, right? Like what happens in this moment, what happens in this day is the only thing that matters. Yeah. And so clearly, Jeff, there's so much life experience you've had, there's so much wisdom that you've gained over the years. If you could go back and you, you just mentioned before your 18 year old self, if you could go back in time and have a conversation with 18 year old Jeff, what would you share with him? Yeah, just uh, don't wait. Someday may never come. You can't bank on your health. That's something I stole from uh, Jeff Alt, who's a author. He wrote, wrote about the Appalachian Trail and, and you know, I, I apparently changed my life because my wife is now out on the Appalachian Trail for the next six months or so um, doing the whole through hike, 2,100 miles from Georgia to Maine. Um, but, but Jeff said that he decided right after college to hike the Appalachian Trail and he spent six months of his life doing that. Um, and people were like, well, why didn't you wait until you were older or something? And what had happened is he was in a car accident and, and he was very fortunate. A car rolled over and it didn't land on him, but it could have landed on him. And he just went, whoa, I can't bank on my health. Like maybe I won't get sick, but I don't know that I won't have my leg crushed, you mm-hmm. know, by a car or I won't get crushed by a car. And I think that that's the advice I would give myself is like, don't wait, just do it now, whatever it is that you want to do, go, go for it. Cause you really only get one chance and that chance is right now. And like, again, that's, that's what I would want to tell myself is the last life ever philosophy. Like, because it took me 20, five years to develop that. Right. I, I, I always lived my life a little bit different than other people, but everyone lives their life a little bit different than other people. But what I didn't do was have that clarity that came from really from starting the process of writing the book that you're reading now, um, that, that, that forced me to evaluate, um, what I was wanting to do with my life. And, and by doing that, um, something that I, only was able to do because I had the flexibility of having real estate and being able to take time off of work. Um, So that would be my other piece of advice for anybody listening at any age is that the secret to life is figuring out how to buy back your time as soon as possible. So you're not selling your time for someone else's goals, hopes, and dreams. 
yeah. figure out how to control your time um, either through, you know, creating passive income for yourself or figuring out how you can be paid to use your time in the way that you, that's important to you. Mm. That's wonderful advice. And I hope that people who are listening, regardless, if you're younger, if you're older, regardless, but especially if you're younger, given what Jeff just said, so often there's a quote that I heard years ago that comes up right now, which is learn from the mistakes of others because you're, you're never going to live long enough to make them all yourself. And so often as people who are older, there's an expression that they use sometimes, was it uh, youth is wasted on the young? I think that's what it is. You get older and you have all this wisdom and then you share it with people who are younger. And oftentimes, whether it's arrogance or whatever it is, a lot of people who are younger, we come from that space of, I'll figure it out. I know you're old. What do you know? And then we make the same <laughs> mistake. Yeah, I, Actually, that's one of the things that I... I feel the most sad about in retrospect is that I didn't listen more carefully when I was younger. Right. Cause mm -hmm. that's the other thing. If I went back and talked to myself, I invented the time machine and went back and talked to 18 year old Jeff, like maybe I would listen. And then only because I'd be amazed that I had invented a time machine and came <laughs> back to talk to myself. Right. But like, if I ran into you, you invented the time machine and I didn't know that you had a time machine and you came back and told me the same advice. I probably wouldn't listen. Yeah. Right. You have to be open to receiving that advice or it's not going to you know, be useful. And that's one of the things that I've really learned uh, over the last few years is that I need to just be fully authentic in myself and tell people what I think and, and, and share my perspective and then be OK if it doesn't resonate with people because it's not going to resonate with everyone. The people that are ready for what I have to say will hear what I have to say and it will change them. Um, the people who are not ready for it, they will think I'm goofy or they will say that sounds nice or they'll be like that person I told you that says, I don't believe you. Um, and, and I could say, wow, that's terrible. I could spend all this time trying to convince them or I could just keep sharing my message and, and hopefully at some point it, it will, you know, it'll break through to them, but it might not. And I have to be okay with that. Um, also to what you just said, everyone is listening. There's a dream. There's a vision. There's something on your heart that either you haven't stepped into yet. You're in the process of it right now, or even if you're on the other side of it, you're real successful, but maybe you've got something new that you want to expand into. Not everyone is going to see it the way you see it. Not everyone's going to love and honor your dream. You're going to have friends. You're going to have family members. You're going to have people in your community who don't agree with whatever your choices are, with whatever it is that's on your heart to do in this world. But I think it was uh, Les Brown. He's a motivational speaker, he's still alive. But when he was in like the 80s, 90s, I saw this video um, probably 10 years ago. And there was this line where he said, if other people, I'm paraphrasing it, but if other people don't essentially buy into your dreams, that's because they were given to you. They weren't given to them. And it's the same kind of idea. If whatever your dream is, protect it. You protect it when you know that that is the life that I would love to live, that extraordinary life without regret, a life on my terms. That's the direction I want to go in. If other people don't see it for you, and if they're older, you still want to listen in the sense of hear what they have to say. They might have some good feedback for you along the way, but also you know, judge based on results. Is somebody living the kind of life that you want to be living? And if they say, well, I wouldn't do that, all right, well, if you do what they do, you're going to have a similar life to what they've created. And if you don't want that, getting clear for yourself, what is that life? Like Jeff said, what's the direction? And then, like I said, what's that pull? What's that, like something in your heart, in your spirit? It's like, I got to go that way and just step into it. I don't know the full thing, but I know I've got the pull and I'm going to step in that direction. And it's amazing what happens. There's a quote, um, it's a long paragraph, I've shared it with you before, but the paraphrased version of it is when you make a decision, when you make a commitment, then, you know, the universe providence moves to, it gives you the opening, it introduces you to the right people, it brings people into your life. When you take action, new opportunities show up to facilitate you continuing the journey. It also cuts off other opportunities, right? Yeah. Because anytime, I mean, and that, I think it might have been you that actually shared it with me, but decision is about, um, it's from the same root as incision, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's about cutting off possibilities too. Mm -hmm. When you make a choice, you're pointing yourself in one direction and the, and, and, and the other directions are necessarily cut off, yeah. we, which, which is okay. 
because some of those directions are things you don't want in your life. And um, one thing that occurs to me is that most people are not living extraordinary lives. Most people are not living the life that they want. Um, most people have a lot of regret in their life. When they're old, most people regret not doing certain things. Um, and, and I think it's inevitable that we're, because we're imperfect, we're gonna, there are going to be times that we make choices that cause us to go, wow, I should have done this differently. Um, but we need to uh, we need to lean into that and recognize and learn from it. And so when you have somebody like a naysayer telling you, oh, that that's not possible, you need to be realistic, whatever it might be, recognize that, like you said, they're probably not living the life that that you want to live. But even if they are, that doesn't mean they're right. Yeah. They're there. You know, you have to do the things that seem right to you. I'm not talking about going, OK, boomer and just discounting whole generations here. Right. Yeah. I'm talking about I'm talking about saying, all right, um, most people are, are, are you know, going to look at your goals. And, and there's there are people that want to pull you down. Right. They'll, they'll like they, they're uncomfortable with your success. So they'll try to claw it back from you to make that you bring you down to their level. And, and the only way to deal with that kind of stuff is to, um, to the extent possible, avoid it, right? Find people in your life that, that will lean into you doing the things that are important to you. Um, that's why like, you know, having you in my life is helpful to me because I know that you're going to believe that I can accomplish the things that I want. One of the things that's core to my belief structure is that everyone has unlimited possibility in their life. And um, so other people tell me they're going to do like things that I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. I, I don't know if I'd want to try that. That seems too much. I don't say that to them. I don't go, oh, that's impossible. Like you can't, I might point out, you know, Hey, there's some challenges you're going to have to overcome here, but I'm going to, if that's what they want to do. And they, you know, Elon Musk's the perfect example of this, right? This guy decided that he wants to solve for um, everything that's going to destroy humanity. Essentially, you know, I think global warming is a problem. I'm going to invent electric cars and solar panels, right. Um, that are more efficient than anyone else's. And Oh, well, they, they say it doesn't work because batteries aren't good enough. Great. I'll build better batteries. Right. Right. You know, and oh, just in case, like, I'm also going to go to Mars and set up a society there. And he probably will. Right. And I, and just in case I want to send my car over there, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all of this, um, all of this stuff that he does, most people would say that's impossible. And Elon Musk didn't grow up super rich. He's just an ordinary guy who happens to be now the richest person in the world because he said about a belief from a, from a position of, well, why can't I, you know, create internet banking? You know, that, that was his first thing, right? PayPal, PayPal. <laughs> you know, why can't I do internet banking? Like I, no one else has done it, but that doesn't mean I can't. And then when he sells that, he's like, oh, I'm going to start a car company making electric cars, you know, until Tesla, it had been over a hundred years since an American car company had been created. Mm. Something that you just alluded to with, with Elon that I want to bring up in case people don't know this I remember watching this video and it was kind of explaining Elon Musk's story. And this is one part I wanted to uh, you know, uh, hint at. So I think it was, he had just launched a few different rockets and they were all failures. And I don't know the price, but each failure costs a lot of money. Whatever that number is, it was really high. And all the money that he had made from PayPal after he sold it was going into, um, I think he was trying to do Tesla at the same time mm, as he yeah. was trying to do... Um, SpaceX, I believe that's what it is. Yeah, they were. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to preemptively jump to where you're going because I think I know <laughs> um, he ended up selling his personal car to pay payroll for Tesla. Like that's how dedicated he was. He didn't believe in failing so much that he didn't leave an alternative. Like he went through a hundred million of his own dollars before he, before either company was profitable. Yeah. And the last part there, my understanding is he had, his perspective was if I liquidate essentially everything I got and put it into this last rocket attempt, I can give it one more shot. Yeah. Otherwise I can let it go and call it quits and then just live on whatever I've got. And he sold it all. <laughs> he went yeah, just hundred percent sold everything. Um, because, because he didn't, he didn't believe in not trying to achieve his goals. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, listen, the, the, the backstory behind SpaceX is fascinating because he started out by trying to buy rockets 
like to build a space company and people wouldn't sell them rockets. Right. I mean, like, cause no one buys rockets. Like it's just not, that's just not what you do. So then he tried to buy rockets from, uh, for, I think it was from Russia at one point too. And then he tried to buy time on other people's rockets. And then he kept making suggestions to them about how they could make their rockets better. And they were like, no. So then he just decided that he was going to build his own rockets and people thought he was insane. Um, and now he has the most efficient and and only reusable rockets in the world. Yeah, I think and, one and of the-, the whole industry has changed because of that. Um, and I remember him saying at one point, uh, the reason that space travel is so expensive is the same reason no one could afford to buy bread if you had to throw away your SUV every time you went to the grocery store. Mm-hmm. And I went, wow, that is a fundamental change in perspective. Um, that and, and, and the reason I bring it up, because it's a little off topic, but the reason I bring it up is I think there's a tremendous amount of wisdom from that. That's like the beach ball thing. Like you have to look at it from a completely different perspective. And the reason he was able to do that is because he didn't build rockets, right? Like he was like, I don't care how everyone else does it. I'm going to figure out how to build my own rockets. He wasn't a rocket engineer that was trained to build rockets because if he had been, he wouldn't have built a completely different version of the rocket. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that comes up in your sharing of this in, for me is the power of commitment and, you know, it's such a big aspect of the work we're doing together and with the work that I do with people is when you think about an Elon story and in your own story, how committed are you to what it is that you say that you want? Do you kind of want it or are you, do you want it with everything that you are? And it's like, when you kind of want it, you'll go until it's uncomfortable and then you might quit or you might stick with it and then it gets more uncomfortable and then you quit. But if this is the most important thing to you, if you just have to find a way, you know, there's a great book called Mastery. Um, I'm blanking on the author, but it's a small book. It's called Mastery. It's a little bit older. And in that book, it's the idea of, do you want to master something or are you a dabbler? Right? And so that same kind of thing, if you want to master it, if you want to give it everything you've got, you'll get where you're going more likely than not. And you're going to enjoy the process along the way. But if you're only going from that space of interest, you'll go until it gets hard and then you quit. I remember seeing a Steve Jobs and Bill Gates interview years ago. And they were on stage together and Steve Jobs basically was, I think it was Q and A. And he said, people keep saying it's important to have passion for what you do. And his response was, I agree, because if you don't have passion, you'll quit because you're sane and it's hard. There's gonna be times along the journey where you're gonna fall. There's times where the challenges seem insurmountable. Notice I said seem, right? Because you can find a way but you got to be committed. You got to be passionate about it. You got to want to do it. Otherwise, what's the point? Why would you keep doing it when it's challenging? And so one, is there something you want to add? No. Well, I mean, I, I think that's right though, what you're saying. Um, what it's kind of like the old, you know, burning the boats when you land kind of thing, right? You're not giving yourself another alternative. If you give yourself a backup plan for whatever it is, that means you don't have a hundred percent belief in your ability to accomplish it. Um, not saying you shouldn't have strategies to protect your downside, right? When you're trying something new, um, because you are going to fail at some stuff. But if something is so important to you that there's no other alternative but to succeed, then you're way more likely to accomplish it. Um, doesn't mean you will, because yeah. you, you know not everything works out. But if you're not giving yourself an out then you're going to have to go forward. And if you can't go back and you have to go forward, then you're going to be going in the right direction and you can make those adjustments. And, you know, it goes back to my rocket analogy earlier, um, which it almost feels like we planned it now because we're talking about Elon Musk <laughs> after that. But, but, uh, but it really does go back to that. Like if you burn up all your fuel getting to space, you pretty much got to get to space. <laughs> like you, you don't have any choice anymore. Yeah. One thing as we wrap up, one thing I'd love to ask you, and it goes really well with what we were just talking about. What is the biggest risk that you've taken that you're deeply grateful for and why? Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I had an opportunity to, um, when, when I quit working my regular job, 
Um, I, had, the company that I was working for was being sold to a publicly traded company. And I, I had an opportunity to take a really nice high paying job at that company. And I went, I don't want to do that. Cause I, I knew that I would get used to making a lot of money and I would um, continue to do that work that wasn't going to be fulfilling to me. And so I decided that I would just try to figure it out. And I uh, walked away from that job opportunity with no other job prospect and no real plan. And people said, you're crazy. And I said, well, um, you know, I'm getting six months severance. <laughs> so that helps. Right. But it wasn't like, you know, six months goes really fast. <laughs> and I just, uh, said to myself, I need to take time right now to figure out what I want to do next. Mm -hmm. And that's what set me on this trajectory, you know, that I'm on now, um, because I decided I wanted to do more real estate, I wanted to lean into that. And uh, I decided, after doing that for a little while that I wanted to help other people get into real estate. So I started a show, a podcast about it and, and started becoming, um, you know, sharing my story more, which caused me to realize that the real passion wasn't sharing real estate, you know, strategies. I don't mind doing that. I, I love real estate, right? But the real passion was helping people figure out how they can do the things that they love. Mm -hmm. um, and I would have never been able to do any of that if I hadn't just taken that leap of faith that was like, I'll figure it out. I'll figure out how I'm going to support myself. Mm -hmm. um, I've got some time. I'm just going to take that time and think about it. One thing that I really want to acknowledge you for, and I hope everyone who's listening makes this same decision. Jeff was willing to bet on himself. Right when you said, I'll figure it out. When you just know, I don't know how, but I'll figure it out. And you just know it. And you move forward one step at a time, one day at a time, one decision at a time. It's all you can ever do. You don't get in your own way with your thinking and trying to figure it all out beforehand. But notice this, going back to a perspective shift, and this goes for everyone listening, all those people who say you're crazy for following your dream, for following your heart, for doing what it is that you feel you're called to do, I might look at it differently and say, well, am I the crazy one or are you the crazy one who's sticking in something that you don't like, that you're not fulfilled in just because it pays you money? You know, and it's like when you can realize that you can make money doing practically anything nowadays, <laughs> there's people with a six figure YouTube channel talking about the Smurfs and that's all they do. You know, <laughs> yeah, that seems like a terrible job to me, but you know, who am I to say, right? <laughs> but, but listen, actually, I do want to add something here. Um, and I know we've got to wrap up soon because we've gone a little bit longer than we anticipated. But when I was working at 7-Eleven, I worked at a 7-Eleven for eight years, my entire time in college, undergrad, grad school, and law school, I worked at 7-Eleven, right? So for eight years, I had a customer um, for the entire eight years that came in five days a week at the same time, five, like 5.15 in the morning. I worked third shift the majority of the time. And uh, he'd walk up to uh, the counter with a coffee and he would say, I'll take a newspaper. And those are the only words he would ever say. No matter what you said to him, he'd always say, I'll take a newspaper or some variant of that, like, and a paper, you know, or whatever. And he'd point at the, the, the local paper and it was like, then you'd give him the price, he'd hand you money and he'd walk out the door and he never said anything else. For, for seven of the eight years I worked there, that's exactly the experience I had with this guy. I didn't even know his name, but I saw him almost every day. Um, and uh, one day he came in and um, <laughs> what? My uh, boss and I actually kind of made a joke about it first, you know, like we, we were like, we would try to get him to say stuff and see whoever could get him to say the most words would like win. Right. So um, one day uh, my boss wasn't there yet. And he said about six words to me, like, I said, like, how are you doing today? And, you know, he said, not too bad or something. Right. I'll take a paper. And I told my boss that, and he went and played back the video because he didn't believe me right? Like to see, <laughs> to see if it was really true. That's how obscene this was. Um, but one day he comes in about an hour later than usual um, on a Monday morning. And I ask him how he's doing and he stops and he starts drinking his coffee. And he's telling me about how excited he is for the week and all of the great stuff he's going to do. He's going to go um, down to this local small lake and he's going to race radio controlled yachts, um, you know, and, and that's going to be amazing and super fun and all this stuff. And, and after that day, and this guy was about 65 years old at this point. After that day, every day he would come in and he was really chatty. And this went on for like a month. And one, one day I said to him, I said, hey, I, you know, I, this is going to sound weird, but like, 
didn't even know who you were, even though I saw you for every day for seven years. And now I know all this stuff about you. You know, he's telling me about how he would take a month off once a year and go to the South Pacific when he was younger and go island hopping and how he'd always loved the South Pacific and all, all this stuff. Right. And he was a really interesting and fascinating guy. I said, so what changed? And he said, the day that I came in and told you about um, the radio controlled boats was my first day of my retirement. Mm. And, um, and then he proceeded to tell me that he hated his job and that he did it because he needed to save up money to retire. And that's when I decided for myself (laughs) that I didn't want to do a job I didn't love no matter what. Um, but there's real, um, wisdom to, to that you can gain from that. You were saying who's crazy the person that goes and does a job because it pays them money and and doesn't do the things that are important to him. This guy would take one month off a year and go to the South Pacific, which is better than what most people do. Frankly, he would use all of his vacation time every year to go to the South Pacific for a month Mm. and Island hop. And, 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 and he was miserable for 11 months a year. And um, there's a book by MJ DeMarco that talks about um, how bad of a deal it is to trade five days of your life for two days off. Yeah. Right. Like um, I think it's called the millionaire fast lane, but, but he also says uh, you know, the even worse deal is to trade 50 weeks of your life for two weeks of, of your life. Like if someone said to you, Hey, Jamil, why don't you give me uh, $5 and I'll give you two. You're not going to take that deal. <laughs> right. Give me $50. I'll give you $2. Right. Mm-hmm. Like we would never take that deal, but that's the deal that most people make. Yeah. They, they, they work a job that doesn't make them happy so that they can have a little bit of time on the weekends to recharge, to get ready to go back to a job they don't love. And one thing to go with that for anyone listening who might hear that and notice that it's not that it's a conscious choice in the sense that some, there's a lot of people who don't know that there's another option. They don't know that there's another way to do it. And when you hear someone like Jeff, when you hear you know more from me in the future, if this is your first time or in the first episode or other guests of mine, there's another way to live. There's a way to live where you're in love with your life. And if you're not already there, hopefully we can come from the space of believing that you're listening to this for a reason. Maybe it's a wake up call. Maybe it's a reminder, whatever it is that you need it to be. Hopefully that's what it is for you. And Jeff, before we wrap up, I'd love to ask, what are you excited about now that you're working on? Well, I am very excited about my book. So I'm under contract to publish it. So that's exciting. Um, And it should be out in the fall. So I don't know exactly when this episode will come out, but, um, you know, several between four or five months from now, the book should be out. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I recently moved to Puerto Rico, which is really awesome. Um, I don't know. I say moved, but like I'm splitting my time right now between Chattanooga and Puerto Rico, which is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. I like the idea of having multiple residences. And uh, if it wasn't for you, I don't think I would be in this exact situation yet. Um, So I'm excited about that and grateful to you for helping me get that process rolling. Um, but, but really everything I do excites me. That's the great part about living mm-hmm. life. The way I live it is that, um, I'm making choices and I, I, and when I make those decisions and I'm cutting off one possibility for the other, I'm deciding between things that are exciting. Like, which one do I want to do more? Like, I really want to build a lodge in Tanzania right now. And I'm looking at that possibility, um, of building a safari lodge so people can go out and see the wildlife, um, but if I decide not to do it, it's going to be because I decided to do something equally awesome. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I, I, um, yeah, even in my real estate investing now, I'm, I'm more interested in doing things that are exciting to me than, than doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, so, so really I'm in a really good spot right now. So if there's one thing I'm excited about, it's that I get so many things awesome to do. I love that, man. First of all, thank you. Um, I hope that everyone is listening. Jeff dropped so much wisdom from his life in this conversation. Please go back. If anything resonated, listen to it again. Apply. So much of what Jeff shared can change your entire life. All you got to do is apply it. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much, Jeff, for being with us today and sharing who you are with us. How can our listeners learn more and connect with you? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously the last life ever philosophy is sort of my overarching thing. And, you know, you know, from being on the show in the past that 
that we have a private Facebook group. It's free to join. Uh, that's the best place to find me, honestly, is just jump into the Facebook group. It's Last Life Ever private group. And I understand you can put that in the show notes so that they can mm-hmm. find it. But it's it, we're not hiding. Um, and much like we're not hiding Last Life Ever, I don't hide myself on social media. I'm everywhere as Jeffrey Holst. So just J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-H-O-L-S-T. Uh, so at Jeffrey Holst on Twitter and Instagram and Jeffrey Holst on Facebook and so I'm really not difficult to find. Um, and uh, if people reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook, I, I always try to respond. Instagram's actually the, the better place to do it because they don't limit the number of friends that you can have. Um, so that way you, you can definitely get my attention there as well. Um, and, you know, I, I do all kinds of really interesting stuff. So, you know, reach out to me and we can talk about any, anything really. I love meeting people. So and helping support them in whatever way I can. Beautiful, man. I highly encourage everyone who's feeling called to it. Reach out to Jeff. He's such an amazing soul to know. And I know your life will be bettered because of it. And so for everyone listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, I encourage you to leave a review. It really helps whether it's on Apple or anywhere that you're listening to this and subscribe so you get updated whenever new episodes come out. As I said a couple of times in the show, you know, what lights me up more than anything in my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers create an extraordinary life without regret. And if I can be of support to you, I'd love to be that for you. And you can connect with me on my website, jamilsayage.com. I'll have the link in the the show notes along with all of Jeff's links that he talked about. And you can also connect with me on Instagram at Dr. Jamil Sayage, DR, and then my name, and just Facebook at Jamil Sayage. So for for all of you tuning in, thank you, Jeff. Again, thank you so much for being here. What I have found is most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck. But you can be different. For you, transformation can start today. So the real questions to be with is, what will you do as a result of what you heard today? What will your future self thank you for? Get clear on that and then go do it. Create a meaningful day. Take care. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.